What price are you willing to pay for what you claim to believe? The pilgrims who founded Plymouth, Massachusetts claim to believe in Jesus, in the Bible, and in the importance of living out your faith and applying it to all realms of life. So much so that they were willing to leave everything in the old world behind and come to the new world with many uncertainties. Because they were so delayed in the voyage of the Mayflower in the fall of 1620, they arrived essentially at the beginning of what turned out to be a brutal winter. The Mayflower Compact was signed November 11, 1620. For the next several weeks, small exploring parties of the pilgrims would set out ashore to discover the lay of the land. They even found a hidden mound of several ears of corn stored by some Indians. That corn saved their lives. So they come to land, they find this cache. Now, it's 1620. They are the most faithful individuals that you can ever realize. And when they found this cache of, of corn, they said, praise God. God provided this for us. When they landed on the tip of Cape Cod, they had run out of food. The men looked around the Cape, found a stash of corn buried in the ground by the Indians, and they took it. They did not steal the corn, they borrowed it, they paid it back later. And in Bradford's diary, when they started meeting with the Native Americans, Bradford said to the envoy going, find out whose corn that was so we can repay it. Had they not taken it, they never would have survived. Because you see, by the end of the first winter, they were doling out a quarter pound of cornbread per person per day to survive on. So as you can well imagine, the mothers took their bread and fed their children. They covered their children with their own bodies to keep them warm. Of those 18 married women, 14 died the first winter, sacrificing themselves for the next generation, knowing if they did not survive, we would not survive. As the pilgrims continued to explore the shoreline of Cape Cod, on December 11th, they came across Plymouth for the first time. It proved to be the ideal place to make their new home. Let's get the scene, wrong place, wrong time, they're all sick, they have come to land in Plymouth. They've decided this is the place because of Town Brook, they were looking for water. In, Brad, in Bradford's diary it says we're very much without ale, we have to land. Because they had ale because ale would, would be much more potable than water. They drunk our first New England water with as much delight as ever we drunk drink in all our lives. William Bradford. During that first winter of 1620 to 1621, they had to stay aboard the ship. It was too difficult to build houses and buildings in the freezing, howling wilderness. That winter proved to be a season of death for the pilgrims. Just about every day, three or four of them died. Most of these died aboard the Mayflower or the common lodge they had managed to build in Plymouth. Among the dead were Christopher Martin, the so-called governor of the Mayflower, and John Carver, the man the pilgrims elected to be their governor. After that, the pilgrims chose, year after year, for about 30 years, William Bradford to be their leader. They buried them in the mound across from the Mayflower, not knowing if the Indians were watching them or they might attack them. They didn't know about the Native Americans, so when they first got here, you know, they, they buried their dead in, in private um, and unmarked graves. Some of the crew members who were dying of contagious diseases were abandoned by their former drinking buddies. Only the pilgrims helped them. In some cases, this touched the hard hearts of some of the crew. Oh, one of them cried to the pilgrims, you, I now see, show your love like Christians indeed one to another. But we let one another lie and die like dogs. Only four families remained intact after that brutal winter of 1620 to 1621. The pilgrims were to find out after settling in Plymouth that in that area, most of the Indians had actually been wiped out in a plague that took place three years before the voyage of the Mayflower. In the end, 
Plymouth and Cape Cod proved to be one of the safest places the pilgrims possibly could have come to set up their peaceful haven for religious liberty. One of the earliest challenges the pilgrims faced was a demographic one. That first winter had killed so many of them that they had to marry and reproduce their way back to a greater population. When the ice cleared up, Captain Jones knew he could now sail the Mayflower back to England. Before he left, he gave an invitation to any of them all, saints or strangers, to return home to England to give it up. After all, half of their number had died that first winter, but no pilgrim took him up on his offer. And for me, one of the most defining moments of their faith came in the spring when Jones turned to them, half their number have died, this is not what they signed up for at all. And Jones says, anybody who wants to come back to England with me, I will take them. Not one of them went. When the Mayflower returned to England, some of the London investors were critical of the pilgrims for not having it laden with goods from the New World. But the pilgrims had been working hard just to survive the brutal winter and had no practical means to supply the ship with beaver skins or clabbered or any other goods. Elder William Brewster was the de facto pastor of the Plymouth colony. William Brewster was a man who was the ruling elder of the pilgrims and uh, he fulfilled the pastoral role when they were here, though he would not uh, function in delivering the sacraments because he believed that an ordained pastor should be the one to do that, and they didn't have an ordained pastor for nine years. Think of it, a church without an ordained pastor for nine years. That's a pretty self-governing church. And William Brewster was not the only one who would preach on Sunday, so uh, they would have a church government that was, of course, by consent of the governed. You know, he was the major religious leader of, of, and, and I always say that he should have written a book because everybody talks about Bradford because he wrote a book and Bruce didn't write a book. <laughs> the church was the central focus of the Pilgrim's Colony. The first building they built served as a church, as a meeting house like a town hall, and even housed some of them. They would often march to church with a drummer ahead of them and with the men bearing muskets and swords for protection. Love. Without the number one commandment, everything else makes no sense. Sunday was an all-day affair. It, it, was, it was huge. You know, when you do the, um, they do the reenactment of the Pilgrim Progress, when they walk, they're walking to church. The Psalms provided the main hymn book for the Pilgrims. Bow down thine ear, Jehovah, answer me. In fact, the whole Bible was the center of their colony and the core of its entire purpose. The, the pilgrims did live according to the Bible. There's no, that was their textbook for life. People come here and they say to me, this is wonderful, but these children, they couldn't have been well educated. There was no formal school, and there wasn't. But they were well educated. They learned at home, their parents taught them, and their textbook was the Bible. But they did have supplementary materials. Governor Bradford himself brought over 400 books with him on the Mayflower. The governor could speak five languages. There were so many victims among the pilgrims of that first lethal winter that there were few intact families by the time the spring came. One of those who died was the wife of their great leader, William Bradford, on December 7th, 1620, even before they discovered Plymouth, Dorothy May Bradford fell off the Mayflower into the freezing waters and perished. Like many other settlers in America, many of whom came to worship Jesus Christ in the purity of conscience, the pilgrims paid a high price that they and their posterity could experience religious freedom. For Providence Forum, I'm Jerry Newcomb.